Their next speaker spoke yesterday. Some of you may have seen him on their personal growth stage. He, he's uh, an author of two fantastic books I highly recommend. One is called Mapping Innovation, really successful, best-selling book. And his previous book, his most recent book, is called Cascades. And Cascades is about creating movements within organizations and life itself. And today we're going to talk about how can we use that idea of creating a movement from an organizational perspective to save the world from AI. Welcome to the stage, Greg Sattel. Good to have you, man. I'm all right. Yeah. So I just want to let you know as well, this episode is being recorded live for the innovation show that I host, and Greg will be on that show. So you can, you can listen back on that as well, including any questions that you have later on. Greg, let's start with the idea of a vision of tomorrow. So Greg has a, an operating system for change. He is he's probably one of the most passionate people I've ever met about change. And he's deeply studied how change happens and how movements happen. And we're going to map that now to this concept of saving the world from AI. Over to you, buddy. Well, before we get to the movement, I'm going to give people a little bit of background. So in 2004, I was running a major news organization during the Orange Revolution. And that's what first got me interested in movements. And to experience the Orange Revolution, it seemed like it was spontaneous. I only learned later through the work of my friend Sergei Popovich, who uh, runs a fantastic organization called the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, that it was actually very planned. And there is a framework and a way of building movements that was first, the initial work was done decades ago by Gene Sharp. But it's, at this point, um, we know how to build these things. There's, the research is there, the scholarship is there, and the, uh, the empirical data is there. We know what works and know what doesn't. So if we decide to build a movement to save the world from AI, the first thing we need to do is set out a grievance and a vision. So grievance is what, what, what's actually the problem, right? Why does the world actually need to be saved from AI? And then we can't just stay mired in grievance. We actually have to have a vision for what we want it to look like. So Phaedra this morning gave us a great vision that we need AI that is audible, explainable, and transparent, right? But before we get that, if people say, if, if we have that solution, people are still gonna say, hold on, what is exactly the problem? Coca-Cola doesn't, isn't transparent about its formula. Why should this product be any different? So, uh, like Phaedra also talked about this morning, we need to show that there's actual harm being done, that there's biases, that we, um, we have serious problems of provenance, of security. If I'm talking to my friend Aiden on the phone, do I really know it's Aiden? So that would be the first step. What's the grievance? What's the problem to be solved? And then what's the vision or what's the end state supposed to look like? And that's how we start. Please, um, over. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I want, if anybody's working in organizational change, this is the formula for organizational change because we try to start to boil the ocean and change everything at once. But Greg's formula actually shows that does not work that way. So let's move on to the, the next in the So the next sequence. step, once you have the grievance and the vision, you want to identify something called a keystone change. Uh, Somewhat similar to a minimum viable product in, um, in, uh, in uh, Lean Startup, but it's not a, you're not testing a hypothesis. Uh, a, a keystone change is, has a concrete and tangible goal. It involves multiple stakeholders, so it's not like three guys in the IT department or something, and it paves the way for future change. 
But the key is you want to shrink failure down so that if you fail, it's not going to hurt you. But if you succeed, it's, it's a step forward. So for, if we're going to start a movement for AI, obviously the gap between that grievance and that vision is huge, right? So um, we want to start with something smaller. Maybe we get test legislation in a single state, or maybe we get a certain level of, uh, a certain number of companies together, and they issue a statement of principles, even, even if it's not enforceable. And that's how you, you, you get the ball rolling. But the important thing about the keystone change is you're always starting with people who are enthusiastic. You always start with the majority. Once you're in the minority, you're going to feel immediate pushback. So you select who you start with is just as important as what you're doing. So those two things, how do you start and who do you start with? And those are the first two things you want to think about with the Keystone chip. So the term Keystone in English for non-native speakers is like if you see on a bridge, there's always one stone that's quite different and that holds the arc of the bridge together. Same like a Keystone habit, one habit that has a knock-on positive effect. I go to the gym, therefore I eat better and I might drink more water. These are Keystone changes. This term Keystone is absolutely valuable. The next in the step is this genome of value, values, which is absolutely core to success. Yeah, so values are one of the most important parts of the movement because values imply constraints. So if you go back to Gandhi, right, or Martin Luther King, nonviolence was a constraint. It, and when you show you're going to constrain yourselves in a certain way, that gives you credibility. You have to define not only stuff you want, but what you will not do. So when we sit down with our clients, we ask them, what are your values? And they usually say, well, we value the customer, we value excellence, we value technology or innovation, whatever it is. And then we say, what do those values cost you? What costs are you willing to incur? When Lou Gerstner went to IBM in 1993, he said, we are going to value the customer. Uh, we're going to switch from the, uh, the stack of technology, technologies to the stack of customer processes. And then he said, and we're willing to lose revenue on every sale. And I've, I've interviewed dozens of executives from, from, from that time. Uh, and Nobody thinks that IBM would still be in business today without that promise because that's what made it credible. He was willing to incur costs. So this is the concept of you have to take a step backwards to take a step forwards and identify what that is. Speaking of that identification, you mentioned there, for example, I don't select a small minority or try to change the minds of the most resistant, but I have to actually take inventory of where the resistance is going to come from and this is the next step. So the resistance, so another thing we do is we do a resistance inventory because to create change, any kind of change, it's not an exercise in persuasion. It's an exercise in overcoming resistance. So you want to think about where that resistance is going to come from on day one. You don't want to wait six months, 12 months down the line when you're, you're getting sandbagged, right? So... We've identified five categories of resistance. Four are perfectly rational. So lack of trust, change fatigue, which was actually a big thing before the pandemic, worse now. Roughly two thirds of employees say that they're uh, experiencing some change fatigue. Uh, competing incentives or commitments, people are either paid paid to do one thing and being asked to do another, or they create commitments themselves. For instance, uh, a leader wants to delegate more, but also wants, you know, sees themselves as pretty, as, as hands-on leadership, right? So it makes them very difficult to actually make good on that change because internally they've committed to something else. 
Uh, the fourth one is switching costs, which there's always going to be switching costs for every chain. So for each of those four, chain, four categories, you want to think ahead of time about who do we expect to resist in, in that way? Um, what form we expect that resistance to take? And then what would be some mitigation strategies? So we're thinking ahead of time what that's going to look like and how we're going to deal with it. But then there's the last category, and that is a, uh, a category of identity, dignity, and sense of self. You can ask people to change what they think or what they do, but you can't ask them to not be who they think they are. So even something simple like agile development. If someone's been a project manager for 25 years, and they take a lot of pride in the job, and they think they do a good job, and you tell them, no, you have to do it differently, that's not just asking them to do something differently. That's asking them to see themselves in a different way. Um, and it's that irrational uh, resistance that we're eventually going to have to deal with. So first of all, you want to avoid those people until you gain traction. Second of all, uh, when you gain traction, almost always at some point, they will lash out and uh, overreach and undermine themselves. And the third strategy is uh, something called a dilemma action, where you set up a choice where either way, they're kind of screwed. So Martin Luther King at Birmingham, uh, uh, Bull Connor could have let them march or he could have cracked down with a fire hose in the, either way he was going to lose. Uh, same thing with Gandhi in the salt march. There's countless examples. So what you do, you start off with a shared value, which you identify in your genome of values, and then you construct a, uh, a I, then you design a constructive act rooted in that sh shared value. So that's what creates the dilemma. They either ne need to let that constructive act go forward or they need to undermine that shared value. So, so that's, let, let's, that's such an important point that I wanted to share because that's often overlooked is how do you identify that shared value? And a great example you give is gay rights, for example, and that instead of it being a battle, it becomes a shared value or a shared vision. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. We, we identify, uh, one, of, one of the best ways to identify shared value is how your opponents are attacking you, especially the most active. And LGBT rights is a great example because for decades they were getting hammered with defense of marriage, um, family values. And then how did they win in the end? We want this... <laughs> We want to live in committed relationships. We want, um, we want to raise healthy and happy families. Uh, so that's a fantastic, and that's one of the things we do when we sit down with clients, we say, what do the opponents say about you? So if we, are, um, if we wanna design a movement to save the world from AI, we would listen exactly to what people are saying about um, uh, what people are, are saying about the fears of AI. For instance, before we were talking about, oh, well, Coca-Cola is, you know, they don't give their formula. Why is this product any different? And we can say, yes, exactly. Every product has liability. We need some form of remedy. We need some, some sort of enforceable remedy, just like we do for other products. So let, let's use that then as an example for AI. So I'm, some of you may have read about Jeffrey Hinton, who's one of the world's foremost experimenters and creators of artificial intelligence. He was in Google and he, re, he resigned essentially because he said, I don't want to work on this, I don't want to contribute it to anymore. He's luckily that he's, he's independently wealthy and he can step away from that. But also he doesn't want to keep feeding the beast. And by that means Google's a commercial entity. And by feeding a commercial entity, there's a drive for profits. So how in that world, to save the world from AI, do we create a shared value for that world? Um, 
again, you have safety and security. But w- what we're getting into now is how do we design tactics, mm. right? Because so far, we are, we're kind of setting the foundations, but we haven't actually figured out what we're going to do. So there's two frameworks, and you can Google these. They've been around for decades. One is called the Spectrum of Allies, and the other is called the Pillars of Support. So the Spectrum of Allies, just like a general would want to map the terrain upon which the military battle is being fought, we want to map the terrain upon which the battle for change is going to be fought. So we want to know exactly uh, who, and, and, and these are not in, f- in terms of specific individuals, but in term, more like um, marketing subgroups. So you have your most active supporters, your passive supporters, your neutral, your uh, passive resistance, and then your active resistance. And the way you move people from right to left is through an appeal to shared values. Um, The second framework is called the pillars of support. Great way to think about this, think about an all-powerful dictator somewhere, like Kim Jong-un or Vladimir Putin, and then imagine that all the janitors don't come into work one day. Now that that dictator is powerless to get the trash cleared up. Every status quo needs institutions to support it. If you, if you can pull those in, you, you can actually make things happen. So we're going to want to map out which institutions are important. So we have governments, we have companies, we have, um, uh, we have nonprofits, we have uh, educational institutions. Um, all the tech companies invest a lot into their university programs. Uh, we have advocacy groups. We, and we start mapping those out. And then, and once we've done that, we can start thinking, who can we mobilize in our spectrum of allies to influence in our pillars of support? We're always mobilizing somebody to influence something. So we want to be clear on what are the targets for mobilization, and what are the targets for influence? The next step then is, I've, I've gone through that, I've mapped my terrain, I've started to map my tactics. And I often think about this, Greg, I'm just gonna revert to a different way of thinking about it. Some of you will have worked in innovation. And when we think about innovation, we think it sometimes of, of just big bucket of change. But innovation involves ideation as an initial stage, coming up with some type of idea. If you're in a, an existing organization, a legacy organization, then incubating that idea, incubation, and then scaling it. So something that you've proven has some type of success, now it's time to support that and bring it on to the next level. That's not often talked about, and you talk about this when you're driving change and change operating systems, is you have to think about how do we survive success? If we succeed, how do we survive that success? Wait, b- before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about scaling. Right? Mm. Because we've got our keystone change, we've had some tactics. But one of the things that makes a movement so powerful, uh, and, and one of the ways it's different from the, a typical top-down initiative, is that movements are about empowerment. So you can scale through a lot of ways. Typical marketing, PR type of things work. Websites, social media. Uh, but there's one thing in particular with movements that's very, very helpful. And you can use this actually in all aspects of your life. We call it a co-optable resource. So instead of trying to get people to do things that we want, um, we give them tools that they can co-opt for their, their own reasons to drive our movement forward. My favorite example of this is TEDx. You have thousands of people around the world um, doing, you know, putting probably millions of man hours to promote the TED event, but they're not doing it for TED, they're doing it themselves. So when we talk about saving the world from, from AI, what resources can we make available to people uh, that they can go and spread the movement uh, for us? I'd, I'd love you to share before we move on to the next step, 
there's a great examples you give in Cascades. Atlassian, you give, you have P&G, the team in P&G who drove change from a small pocket of the organization, because I think a lot of people yeah. will relate to this one. That's a great, it's one of my favorite stories. Um, it actually wasn't in Cascades, it was as a result of Cascades. So what happened is a guy named John Gadsby. Uh, he's, he was in his mid-30s. I think he's 38 now, so it was, he was probably about 35. Middle of the middle management. And he, he had achieved something. He still can't tell me the problem he fixed, but apparently it, it, it had been a problem for, for a while, and, and it, it made a big impact. And he, he won an award from the CTO, and he told the CTO, you know, I could do this around the whole. So she said, okay, I'll give you, give you a shot. He had like no budget, no, he, he, he had a couple of senior executives as adult supervision minding him. <laughs> and just as this happened, Cascades came out. And within, and he, he used it as, as the model. And within, I think it was uh, six months, he had 1,800 people in this movement for process improvement. I talked to him uh, a few weeks ago. It's now up to 60,000. Even in his company the size of Procter & Gamble, 60,000 is a lot of people. And this is a great segue into your final point, and then I think we can go to questions, of surviving victory. Um, and I, I mentioned this uh, yesterday, but I, I, it's such a good example. I just want to ask, has anybody had this situation where you're in a meeting and something is proposed and over the course of an hour, things are moving slowly towards a consensus. And then at the end of the hour, you're going to next steps and all of a sudden somebody who hadn't said anything the entire time, throws a complete hissy fit and completely discredits himself. Anybody's ever seen that, just clap your hands. So think about why that happens. For whatever reason, there, this proposal threatened an attachment, something that they were attached to, some part of their identity. Their, their objection to it was so visceral, they couldn't even articulate it. That's how angry it made them. And then what triggered them was the next steps. Because until then, they thought they could ignore it. But now that they saw that, um, now that they saw that it, the, it, the change is a real possibility, they, they, they had no other option but to attack. Um, so we tend to think that once we have our first victory, once we get our project bu budgeted, once we get, um, once we get uh, executive approval or, or get that first project, that everything's going to be downhill from there. No, it's pr almost always it gets harder because that's when the knives come out. Another thing to remember is that you're, um, most of the time they don't throw that hissy fit. Yeah. They go and they silently sabotage you in the hallways. So you, again, you need to think ahead of time. We like to call it a change demon. We, what would an evil demon, <laughs> if they could sabotage you, if they could possess anybody in your organization to sabotage you, how would they go about it? What would an, uh, a person possessed by an evil, evil demon, how would they try and kill you? And how would you mitigate that? Inevitably, the way you, you do that is, again, an appeal to shared values. So, uh, and I, as I mentioned my talk yesterday, change, we never want to bet our change on any particular person or technology or strategy or policy. It's always based on shared values. So when people ask us, um, how, do, how do we save the world from AI? 
We're not talking about a particular policy. We're not talking about a particular strategy. It's about things we all value. Security, safety, prosperity. And that's how you build a movement. Save the world from AI. Beautiful. And a great way to think about it, I often think about this when I read your work, it's like there's that side and there's this side and it's bringing them together and looking at the intersection of the Venn diagram because that's where the sweet spot is. And then you put all your tactics into place around that. I'd love to come to you guys because there was a lot of questions for Greg yesterday. So my colleague Nasrini will hand around a microphone. If, if we have our question right up the top here, Nasrini. Thank you. Test, test, test. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, awesome. Yeah. So much fun, both of you. Thank oh, it's you so Pedro. much. I, we can, I can't even Sorry. see you. Yeah. I'm over here. <laughs> this was really, really fun. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope to see you both on more stages because I think this is a really important conversation. Um, <clears throat> I Have you ever watched or read Rules for Rulers? Greg, no, I, no, I haven't Greg, seen that. Oh, this, oh. you've got to read this. This is going to be perfect for you, I think, because um, they talk uh, very similarly using metaphors that, that you discussed on stage, and they even have like a comic strip. It's, it's awesome. Uh, but I, I just wanted to say I, I really enjoyed the conversation. When I have interactions with people where I, I feel like I'm going up against their self-identity, as you described, in this domain, to me, it feels very much like suddenly I'm having a religious argument. You, mm -hmm. you start to sort of feel this, this strange tension. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition to, to trying to see if I can elicit shared values, it's why I started to push into things like humor as a way to just get people to lower their defenses. Uh, that's, that's something else that, that I used as well. I was curious, have you seen other folks or uh, use humor or maybe even pop culture as a means to, to get a shared understanding? Mm -hmm. It's So, my friend who I learned all of this from, Serja Popovich, he actually has a name for it. He calls it laughtivism. And when they were building the movement to overthrow Milosevic, they did it with street pranks. You have to be careful about humor that you're not violating a shared value. You're not being seen as disrespectful. You're not, um, you're not violating some covenant. Sometimes people use humor in a, in a way that's cutting and, and it, they think they're being cute, but they're actually turning people off. But you can definitely, and I think your cartoons are a fantastic example of that. One of the things, one of the first actions they did in Serbia is they put a, a barrel um, on a fashionable street in Belgrade, and they put Milosevic's face on it, and they said, uh, and it said, uh, smash his face for a dinar, and they had a stick there. Dinar is about two cents. So you can imagine what happened. People started walking around and smiling, and finally somebody puts a dinar in and hits it, and then a line starts to form, and eventually the police come. But they didn't know what to do because they couldn't arrest people for smashing a barrel. That would be ridiculous. They couldn't arrest the, the protesters who did this because... They were down the street of, at a cafe watching all this, laughing their heads off. So they had to, um, th uh, th they had to arrest the barrel. Now, remember, this is the country that gave us the Yugo. So they're trying to you have these overweight cops trying to wrestle this big barrel into this small Yugo police car. And of course, the protesters, it was a group called Otpur, they had... Uh, notified the media, so they took pictures of it. And of course, the regime looked ridiculous. And a dictator can afford a lot of things, but ri looking ridiculous isn't one of them. So that kind of humor, not directed at somebody, but directed at a situation, rooted in shared values, can be incredibly, uh, in incredibly 
uh, useful and helpful. Thanks, it's a great Thank question. Thank you, well done. And I just want to say for people who have missed Phaedra this morning, her, we re referenced Phaedra. She also has a brand new book out, AI for the Rest of Us. It's about transparency in AI and equality in AI. It's really, really important. And I also say that for the audience of the Innovation Show. Phaedra, I'm going to be hitting you up in the future to come onto the show. Phaedra is also a beautiful name. It's a Greek name and it means bright or light. And she's shining a light on a very important topic as well. Any other questions out there? Hello, yeah, here. Oh, can you hear me? I can't yes. see you though. Yes, <laughs> oh, there you are. Hello, hello. Um, hi, my name is Ligia. Thank you for, for the talk. I, was, I, I want to go back to the, to the main topic and the title. And I would be curious to know, like, yeah, we are talking about how to save world from AI, but I'm curious to know your opinion about why do we need to save? Uh, um, what, what do you think? Do you really think that we need to save uh, the world for AI? Um, what are the main risks that you see nowadays? Because we are seeing so much, and we also relate innovation always to change, and we need to have a, a, a bit of take, risk taking, but at the same time, yeah, um, uh, caring and understanding it better. So um, I'm just curious to know a little bit more why and, and why do you think, do you really think that we need to save uh, the world from AI? Yeah, just to be clear, I'm not an expert on mm -hmm. AI, but I think there's a long precedent, um, certainly with nuclear energy, where the scientists themselves sounded the call and the world did need to be saved from nuclear weapons, and we saved it. Uh, another excellent precedent, I think, was, I think it was in 1973, when recombinant DNA was, um, was first discovered. Uh, the discoverer of that, Paul Berg, he set up a conference at Asilomar to lay down the rules. So, uh, in, in effect, to uh, save the world from recombinant DNA. I would argue that we have not had that effort in AI. And we are talking about a very, very powerful technology that we really don't understand. Um, when experts, you know, some of the pioneers of the technology, like Jeffrey Hinton or Jan LeCun, many others, say that there's a reason to be worried, I think there's a reason to be worried. One, one of the, you know, you mentioned innovation, so you obviously work or understand the field. And one of the ways we think about regulation and innovation is it's an enemy of innovation. And one of the wisest things, like him or love him or hate him, <laughs> Elon Musk said, is that AI is one of those rare exceptions where we need to get ahead of it with regulation and actually be able to almost stop things. But there's so many elements, and, and I, I didn't want to focus on the solutions today, but actually Greg's offering a platform that can work for this. So there's so many different solutions, and if we actually pick a solution, we'll create another side. Sure. And we want to try and create a common ground or common language to understand this as well. So great Thank question. You. Thank you. you. Anybody else? Any, any questions out there? One of, the, one of the things that I just thought I'd mention, Greg, is there's a, there's a great fear about, it's called technological unemployment, which is unemployment brought about automation, automation robotics, AI. And I, I often think about this like pension funds. So there's a crisis in pension funds. And if you think about how a pension fund works, somebody works for X amount of years, increasingly longer, because we're living increasingly longer. And then they are supported by the rest of the working population. But that is out of balance now. And I think about that as that balance where there's increasingly more people who are not working, they need to be supported and then there's enough, not enough people to support them. And I go, think about that as a template now and add it as a lens and look at the workforce because more and more organizations take Ford or General Motors in the past, they had thousands and thousands of employees to create a certain revenue stream per employee but now if you look at unicorn businesses or AI businesses or many of the tech firms, they have way less employees for huge valuations. So it's, a, it's almost like a game of musical chairs that we're running out of chairs, which are jobs for people. So in that world, I'd love your opinion because this is 
definitely on the minds of many, many people. And there's many people who are students out there as well, and they're wondering about that kind of future. Slightly off topic, but I know it's in the minds of people. Well, right now we have labor shortages, yeah. not labor surplus. And I think it really comes down to the productivity effect. And it's one of the problems with digital technology. It hasn't created the same productivity effects as earlier technologies. So there, if you think earlier technologies like a car. So you had Henry Ford who grew up on a, on a farm. He was, because of automation, which was uh, mechanized tractors and so forth, uh, he didn't have to work on, there wasn't work for him on his family farm, which he was actually very happy about. So he went to work for Thomas Edison to make more money. That's the replacement effect. But then there was also a reinstatement effect. He took that, uh, he took that extra time and he put it into inventing a car. And because there was a productivity effect, and starting in the 1920s, we had a 50-year boom in productivity, that extra activity, that industry he created, and others were able to make everybody better off. So I think when we talk about saving the world from AI, we also need to talk about how are we going to use AI to save the world? Because applying AI to things like materials discovery, drug discovery, we can really make a much, much better world for everyone. Beautiful. I'm going to leave it on that because I think that's a really nice way. And that's the goal of all this work and indeed of the 15 Seconds Festival. For those of you who are continuing to join us on the tech stage, my name is Aidan McCullough. I'm going to, I don't, I don't have a, a mic to do a mic drop, but I'm going to do a mic swap because my, Greg's going to take over for me because I have a flight back to Dublin and Ireland. And uh, it's been a pleasure joining you. But I want to mostly thank our guest today, author of two great books. I highly, highly recommend them. A lot of innovation practitioners say Mapping Innovation is the best book on innovation. It looks at all different frameworks and it has Greg's style infused throughout it. And also his other book, this book that is based on what a lot of the things we talked about today is called Cascades. And Greg, also, for those people with us today and those people on the Innovation Show, you've made some resources available on your website. Where can people find that? So um, you can find me at digitaltonto.com and also at gregsatel.com. And you can find any of us on LinkedIn. It's been a pleasure, and I'm going to hand over to your new MC from now on, Greg Sattel. Thank you, guys.